All right. Hello, and thank you for joining me for Stencil Printing 101, an integral part of the Jumpstart program for the third year in a row. I am Chris Shea. I started the stencil printing course about 10 years ago and started giving it away for free a few years ago. And this summer, I was lucky enough to have a brilliant young intern working for me who gave it a little extra jazz and pumped it up a little bit to make it a little more exciting because we are not going to be um, showing it live. So we had to add a little jazz to it. So with that said, let's talk about stencil printing. First of all, we're here at SMTA because we want to learn more about surface mount technology. Um, it's a pretty basic manufacturing process. We print solder paste onto the circuit board. Then we inspect it. SPI and step number two stands for solder paste inspection. Then we go through what we call a pick and place machine where we put components into the solder paste and then we reflow them where we make the solder joints. Now, printing the solder paste onto the circuit board is the first step in the process and it is arguably where your profits are made or lost in the process. If you see the stop sign here, if you do not print successfully, you have compromised your entire process and you are going to run into an issue down the line after you've added more value to the circuit board, which is why we like to inspect our paste prints and why SPI has become so popular over the years because it truly does save a lot of money and a lot of headaches down the road. Here is a diagram of your basic surface mount assembly line. At the first the front of the line we have the paste printer which deposits the solder paste onto the PCB. Next we have the SPI machine. The SPI machine inspects the solder paste deposits and makes sure they conform to certain tolerance standards that the engineer set. We, in SPI, we look for excessive solder that could create bridges or shorts, insufficient solder that could create opens or unreliable joints, um, solder deposits that are too big that might cause bridges or too tall. And, um, we can program all these in to make sure no escapes get down the line that will cause problems later on. Um, the placement machine is where we pick and place all our electronic components and place them into what we call the wet solder paste deposits. And finally, we have the reflow process. This is where a thermal excursion takes place and the board is heated to a particular time and temperature profile. This process activates the fluxes to clean up the oxides on the boards, the component leads, and the solder paste itself. It also melts the solder and starts forming the intermetallics that makes the final solder joint. So the reflow oven is where the reliability is made or lost, and it is just as important as any other process on the line, but you have to keep in mind that if you don't have the right print deposit, you will never get the right solder joint out of the reflow oven. So to ensure that we have um, everything in order, quite often we will add an automated optical inspection machine to the line. Um, these AOI machines placed before the reflow oven can identify placement presence or absence. It can identify wrong values on components. It can identify transient components or wrong orientations. Um, so these defects can be fixed, unfortunately, by hand, but these defects can be fixed before the reflow oven and whoever is in charge of the process that is making the errors can resolve it before any more are made. Um, we also sometimes place AOI after the reflow operation to check the quality of our solder joints. Now, let's talk about the language of circuit boards for a little bit. Um, what we're looking at is a pretty busy slide. So let's start at the top. And what we have up here is a component body. Um, we're gonna say it's a land grid array um, for uh, purposes of illustration. And right here is the component land or the component pad. Then we deposit solder paste on top of what here is called the circuit board pad or the PCB pad. Now, when you look at this, you will see that the solder mask comes up onto this pad but gives 
space before that pad. So let's talk about that for a little while. These pads are etched in copper during the fabrication of the board itself. They create the interconnections between the components and the PCB or other components. Um, and the solder mask you see on the board is a really thin layer of dielectric material. It's like one or two mils thick that protects the traces on the board from oxidation. It also protects them from accidental solder wicking off of the pad and down the trace or solder bridging between traces and certain soldering operations. Um, now the distance between these pads is called the pitch. Um, now, Many, many years ago when I started in this business, we considered fine pitch 25 mil. Um, and we still do, except since then we've gotten down to much finer and finer, finer pitches and printing just keeps getting a little bit more challenging every day. Um, now, on fine pitch devices, there's a couple different ways we can define these pads. Why is how we define these pads so important? Well, there's a couple good reasons. If we do a non-solder mask defined pad, which is right here, which we might also call metal defined or copper defined, we etch it to its nominal size and then we relieve the mask by three mils around it to account for mask alignment errors in the fabrication process. So if we're looking for a 10 mil pad, we can call out 10 mils, five mil radius, and then we would have a 16 mil solder mask relief around it. Now, the smaller these pads get, the harder they are for the fabricator to etch, and the harder they are to stay on the board when um, the uh, joint is under shear due to either shock vibe drop or thermal cycling. Um, when we go with a solder mask to fine pad, we etch the copper to the larger size and let the way the, the mask encroaches or overlaps on the pad to define that. So now if it's a 10 mil pad, we have etched it at 16 and we've brought our mask down to 10. That gives us a lot more room for error in the etching process. And um, I will show you on this next slide. When we mass define it, it's easier to etch. So it's a good DFM thing for manufacturing for the fabrication part, but also it's good for printing because when we have mask up on all sides of the pad, we can make that stencil aperture seat or gasket really nicely on the pad. So it makes it much easier for us to print so that's a good design for assembly tip. Now, if we go non-solder mass defined or copper defined, the pad is a nominal size. So below eight mils, it's really hard for the fabricator to, um, to hold tolerance. And as you can see just in this picture, there's sort of a trapezoidal shape to the pad anyway. Um, so undersized pads present serious gasketing issues. They're much harder to print because you can't get a good seal between the stencil and the pad. So paste is probably going to squeeze out on the side and we'll show pictures of that later. Now there's a reliability portion of um, copper defined pad that reliability is like because here the solder joint wraps all the way around the circumference of the pad, which gives you better shear strength. So, um, there's a bit of a trade-off. I typically recommend that anything 0.4 millimeter pitch, that 16 mil pitch, or any feature size 8 mils or below, you definitely want to mask defined. Um, and as this question at the bottom asks, why do we care about it? Because it seriously impacts the printability. I'm going to show you some data in a few minutes that will make you remember to go mask defined, if nothing else. Okay, so now this section here is curiously called from t-shirts to circuit boards. How did we get from t-shirts to circuit boards? How did we get into stencil printing? Well, 35 years ago, we cut the leads off some through hole parts and had to figure out how to get solder paste down on a circuit board and went to the t-shirt manufacturing industry. Does this 
24 by 24 frame look familiar to anyone? And look, we've got a squeegee here and we pull it across the surface, pressing the print media through the stencil onto the substrate below. Um, guys, this is how we started out making circuit boards um, with screens with mesh that we pushed solder paste through and rubber squeegees. We took it directly from uh, t-shirt manufacturing. So we upscaled it a little bit, but as you can see there, we um, pull the blade across the surface, the stencil and the newly surface are separated and voila, you have a t-shirt. Um, I know some people might not like that Pat's logo, but that's the one I grew up with, so that's the one I chose for this. Um, now, let's talk about not t-shirts, but circuit boards. This is a big busy slide. I'll give you a moment to take it in. So, let's talk about how we print paste on a circuit board. What we're seeing here is a not to scale diagram of a circuit board, the metal pads on it that are gonna conduct the signals, a stencil meant to deposit the paste, the paste itself and the squeegee that delivers it. Now, we must have board support in the printer to keep the board from shifting or bending. Number one thing, number two thing, and number three thing in printing is board support, board support, and board support. Now, after the board moves into the printer, it's aligned by a vision system and raised up so that these metal pads should align with the circuit board. Or I apologize, these metal pads should align with the stencil. And you can see where they do on each corner here. That's what we call good gasketing because that stencil aperture is seated squarely on the pad. Then the squeegee starts moving and that solder paste rolls. And the rolling, as we'll talk about in a moment, is what gets that solder paste to flow inside those apertures. After the squeegee passes, the board lowers and exits the machine. Now the whole goal here is to get the proper amount of solder paste at the proper location and the proper shape. And that's why we have inspection machines to cover that for us. Now, these printers aren't like the printers on your desk at all, at all, at all. Here is a nice complicated picture of an MPM Edison and here's sort of a much simpler diagram. Now, our printers always follow the right hand rule. Everybody remembers that from physics. If you put your right hand in front of you and you cross X into Y, Z comes up. So all of our machines on a surface mount line have an origin at the left front and this is positive X, this is positive Z, and going back into the screen here is positive Y. So. What we've got here is a, um, a very schematic drawing. Again, we've got board support, or if there's no board in the machine, it would be an under stencil cleaning system. You can see the rollers down here in this image that we got from ITW. Now, here we have a conveyor, a very simplified version of a circuit board, a very simplified version of a stencil. This represents the solder paste bead, and this represents the squeegee. So the board comes in, comes up to the, the stencil, the squeegee rolls the solder paste across, it fills the apertures, the board pops down and then moves on out to the SPI machine. Um, some of you will notice I never say to the placement machine because I believe every line should have an SPI on it and I don't even work for any SPI companies. Um, but now let's talk about what's going on inside there. Right? First of all, we have to get good alignment and gasketing of the aperture to the pads. Then we talk about how squeegee motion thins the paste so it will flow. And after the paste flows into these little holes, it stiffens up, the board pops out, and everything is beautiful. Well, that's not always the case. So let's talk about what can go right and what can go wrong. The, um, the title of this chapter is called Talk Printing to Me. 
Okay, so let's start out with some basic print and wipe language. By now, everybody watching is probably getting used to my little schematic diagram of a circuit board, a stencil, a little solder mask, pads, squeegee. Now, the squeegee, as it moves across the stencil, we call those strokes. They go front to rear and rear to front. Now, when we start printing, we have the option of loading the solder paste in the front and making the first stroke go front to rear. I like loading the paste in the rear so that that first stroke comes rear to front because I want to see that paste rolling. If that paste isn't rolling, you're not going to get a good print. So we're going to spend some time talking about paste rolling. Now, sometimes between prints, we need to clean the bottom side of the stencil. All that paste getting pushed through there, sooner or later we get some stuck on the bottom side. So we usually have wipers on board. The wiper moves under the stencil and what we call passes. So remember, squeegees are strokes, wipers are passes. And that wiper passes under to wipe the uh, errant solder paste from the bottom of the stencil. There's a number of different wipers out there. Um, some of them perform a single function in a wipe. So it would do a wet wipe, change direction to another pass. That would be a vacuum wipe and change direction to another pass. That might be a vacuum or dry wipe. And the order of those passes is what we call the wipe sequence. Now there's a newer hardware out there <clears throat> on machines that can do all that in a single pass. And um, it's fairly new and we're gonna be running an experiment with it this year. So stay tuned is all I can say on that because we will have some fresh data very, very soon. Um, let's talk about stencils. A lot of terminology in stencils. Okay, so what we have on the very outside is the frame. Um, there's two type of standard frames out there. The tube, which is about an inch and a half thick, and it's a square cross section, a hollow cross section square. Um, if you're running a high tension stencil, it'll have a heavier section, so you'll know it, it's heavier. Um, or what we call the space saver, which is a solid cast aluminum frame that's only about a half inch thick. So the reason the industry migrated from the tubes, from the t-shirt machines to the space savers was to save on storage space. <clears throat> and since then, we've actually developed as an industry frameless stencils that use a common frame with interchangeable foils. And so now, rather than storing one and a half inch thick tubes or half inch thick space savers, you're storing foils in cardboard sleeves that are maybe a quarter inch thick. Um, so it really, really helps to compress your storage space. Now the foil itself is this piece of metal in here. It's a lot more rigid than your aluminum foil because it's made out of stainless steel and sometimes very hard steel, um, which seems to work the best in surface mount. They're usually four or five or maybe six mils thick. Um, I think the majority of stencils these days are four mils. Um, five mils was real popular for a while and we see people sitting down every day as components get smaller and apertures get smaller. And well, that's something we'll talk about in a few minutes as well. Now, the holes in the stencils here that we push the paste through with a squeegee, we refer to those as apertures. Um, apertures is a nice big word for hole. Um, now, there's two different ways to form these. One is to electroform it in a plating tank with some artwork and um, resist to create those apertures. Another is to electroform just that sheet or foil in a tank and laser cut the apertures. And you can, um, for my money, uh, all the tests I've run over the years, the laser cut apertures always provide better size and location accuracy. And for the most part, for the majority of laser cut nickel or laser cut electroform nickel foils, um, I've seen a lot of thickness variation across the foil, but every day that gets improved upon. So I was just speaking with um, 
uh, a foil manufacturer the other night who said they really, really got it down. So again, um, when I get data, I'll be happy to share it. Now, down here, we have this mesh in here and this mesh attaches the foil to the frame and it is tensioned very high. So it tends the tension of the foil. Um, the tension of the foil has a lot to do with how well it releases from the circuit board. Um, and these frameless stencils that I mentioned, they don't use mesh. The uh, foils attach directly to the front frame. And finally, what we'll see in the stencil, usually two or my preference is three corners, are fiducials. They're small little half burnt marks in the stencil, which allow the printer to identify the stencil's position and match up with the same fiducials on the board or do the best fit that it can. Okay, now let's talk about the apertures inside the stencils. Um, a very, very, very important feature of the aperture is what we call the area ratio. The area ratio helps us predict how much solder paste is going to come out of that aperture. And the reason we look at this is because, um, well, solder paste is sticky stuff. It wants to stick to the pad that we're printing it on, but it also wants to stick to the aperture wall of the stencil. So I kind of look at the force of the adhesion force of the paste to the pad as the forces of good and the adhesion force of the paste to the stencil as the forces of evil. And what we want to do is we want the forces of good to overcome the forces of evil. Since the adhesion forces are proportional to the areas, we don't even have to worry about how sticky the paste is. All we have to do is divide the area of the circuit side opening by the area of the walls. And that gives us the area ratio. And if it's better than 0.66, printing will be easy. If it's below 0.66, it's gonna start getting challenging. And if it's below 0.5, well, you better be pretty good at it. Now, there's a couple different ways to calculate the area ratio. If you go and do all the geometry, and I'm sure somebody is uh, right now at their desk doing the geometry for the area of the wall, or the area of a cylinder and the area of a circle and doing the algebra to cross out the pies and the squares. And what we're gonna come up with is the area ratio on a square is the side length of the square divided by four times the stencil thickness. So let's say the side length of the square was 10 mils and the stencil thickness was five mils. So 10 divided by 20 means you have an area ratio of 0.5 that's gonna re be really, really difficult to print. Now, um, let's say it's a 10 mil circle. It's the same thing. If you sit and do the geometry formulas and the algebra, you'll find out that all you need to do on a square circle is look at that major dimension and divide it by four times the stencil thickness. For years, people have thought I'm a genius or some sort of savant on the top floor when I could do an area ratio in my head and really, all I'm doing is taking the main dimension and dividing it by 16 or 20. So now I've given that away. Um, if it's any more difficult than that, I go to this calculator online from BeamOn and it gives us all kinds of different aperture shapes that we can uh, look at and uh, use a slider to look for um, the optimum stencil size based on area ratio. I really like it. Um, now, speaking of area ratio, when your stencil vendor gets your stencil, he should be able to send you an area ratio report and highlight any area ratios. Typically under 0.7 is what they will highlight. Um, so if your stencil vendor is not giving you an AI report, um, you should ask them for them because most of them run them at least internally before they start cutting metal. Okay, so that's the area ratio. And now we said it helps predict how much paste will come from the aperture. Let's see how that works with transfer efficiency. Transfer efficiency is how much paste actually came out of the aperture. So we look at the amount of the paste deposited divided by the volume of the aperture. And this illustrates it pretty well. If you have a round aperture, um, you would love to have that perfect hockey puck printed but what happens as the forces of good 
are fighting the forces of evil during release is you don't get 100% release. You often get these things that look more like truncated cones or even Hershey kisses. Um, what we want to see, to think we have a robust process, and this is not carved in stone on a mountaintop anywhere, this is a rule of thumb that's developed over the years, is to say we have a robust process, we would like to see a minimum of 80% transfer efficiency when possible. But it's not all about transfer efficiency, we also have to minimize variation. Minimizing the variation is actually more important than maximizing the transfer, because if you're doing a BGA with 200 IOs on it, and one, one out of those 200 prints comes up short and you get an insufficient solder joint, you're reworking all 200. You're not just reworking that one. That's where variation comes into play. But let's look at this chart on the right. Um, this was a study we did over five years ago. Um, looking at transfer efficiencies for different stencil foils and nano coatings. And at the area ratio of 0 0.6066, we want to see about 80% transfer. And that's exactly what we saw on a standard uncoated stencil. Now, um, with some of the coatings that we'll talk about in a little while, we saw much better transfer efficiency rates and even some hitting 100% um, in that 6-5 area ratio, which was very, very impressive. So we look at where we get 80% transfer and we know that with these two stencils, we can probably make it happen down to a 0.55 area ratio. These two fall out right around 0.6. So now let's talk about nano coating a little bit. Um, nano coating your stencil is going to help you avoid a lot of bumps in the road. I personally think every stencil out there should be nano coated, whether you have fine pitch or not, because it helps with your under stencil cleaning requirements as well. But these pictures, because they're blown up so much, look a little grainy. These are SEMs of stencil apertures that have been laser cut. Uh, you can see the striations around the, the top surface where the laser penetrated and then hot air blows the molten metal away so when you see those striations get a little more random near the bottom that is actually from turbulence from the air as it's blowing it through anyway this is a really really good cut that we're showing here and it's still got valleys and hills in the walls so when we nano coat it with a polymer nano coating we fill all those hills and valleys and we get a really smooth wall and that smooth wall has lower surface energy to begin with than the metal because it's polymer. So it helps repel solder paste the same way fresh wax repels rain off a car or rain X repels um, rain off the windshield or the stuff I squirt on my shower glass shower door keeps it from getting full of white spots. The same exact principle. So, how does this help improve print quality? Well, first of all, there's less adhesion between the paste and the wall. So, we have automatically minimized the forces of evil. The forces of good, the aperture, diameter has stayed the same, but the forces of evil, the adhesion of the walls, has dramatically dropped. Also, because we have a smooth wall, instead of all these fissures and valleys, we have less surface area of the wall that we have um, adhesion to. And we have um, less really bumps in the road that keep the paste from, from flowing through. So what do we get out of this? Typically higher volumes, much lower variation, and better shapes. It's especially effective if you're running area ratios less than 0.66. But Again, in my opinion, even if you're not running below 0.66, it's worth coating your stencils because of the um, better underweight uh, properties that it provides you. So let's just see for ourselves um, what nano coating does for us. I took these pictures. Um, we did a release study with Kaizen and got these pictures um, from a camera mounted in the printer. Uh, sideways to capture the release. So we are down at probably the lowest area ratio we want to go without coating. 
And then we're down lower, at the area ratio 0.55, which is around your 0.5 millimeter pitch BGAs if you're running a five mil foil, and even down to 0.45, which we're starting to see on the 0.4 BGAs, uh, even on the eight mil foils. Or I'm sorry, even on three mil foils sometimes. So let's look at nano coated versus uncoated. Okay, well, we clearly have taller deposits there, don't we? Yep, we do. But again, 6.5, so you don't see that big a difference. Let's get down to 5.5. Five. Ooh, yeah, okay. Now we're seeing a difference. Now we're still seeing uniform deposits, and these guys, eh, maybe not so much. And when we get down, to, I'm sorry, the other way around. Um, here we're seeing the flat tops. Here we're seeing the Hershey Kisses, and we get down to 4.5. or five, And we still have good deposits on the, on, on the coated but not so much on the uncoated. So again, the closer you get migrating towards the Hershey Kiss shape, the less paste you're taking out of the stencil and the more you're probably leaving underneath it. So again, the Hershey Kiss means there's gonna be trouble ahead. You ideally want your deposit to look more like a puck and less like a cone because the more it's looking like a cone, the more paste you're leaving in the aperture that will get dried up or snap back on the bottom of the stencil and mess with the gasketing on your next print. So before I, I switch slides, I'll give you one more moment to take in coated versus uncoated and not even wonder why I'm recommending coating. Okay, so what if you don't nano coat your stencil and you wonder why your yields are bad? Um, duh. It's sort of like grabbing a dish from the oven without a mitt and wondering why your hand got burnt. Seriously, just do it. Um, but let's look at some data here. Now, I ran this data myself so I can vouch for it. And when we talk about the best case scenario for printing square mask defined pads and apertures are way better than circular copper defined pads and apertures. Now, what I'm showing on this axis here is the aperture size in mils and the area ratio based on that. So really what we're looking at is the same paste, the same board, the same everything except one stencil was coated and one stencil was uncoated. So let's start with the easy stuff, 0.75 area ratio. Um, and these little things we see in boxes are coefficients of variation. That's just a fancy term for the standard deviation divided by the mean. So the standard deviation here is 8% of the mean, and on the coded, it's only 3% of the mean. Now, typically, anything under 10% we like. 10 to 15% is a warning, and over 15% is a no-no. So on our best case scenario, we can keep a good process on a coated stencil and uncoated stencil at 11 mil. When we get down to 10 mil, our uncoated stencil starts getting troublesome. When we get down to nine mil, it's far more troublesome. And when we get down to eight mil, which is an area ratio of 0.5, the uncoated stencil cannot handle it. So look at this, even down at eight mil, we've got 5% variation. So when I spoke about minimizing variation being as important as maximizing transfer, here's what you see why. When we're running that 10 mil pad on that ah, 0.5 BGA, if we're running on an uncoated stencil, we're running into dangerous territory. That's with mass defined pads. Let's shoot down to the same thing for copper defined pads. Holy cow, this is um, completely unacceptable. Um, so on copper defined pads, we can, with a coated stencil, get ourselves down to a 10 mil feature that we can print repeatably. On mass defined pads, we can get ourselves down to an eight mil feature. Wow. Okay, so that speaks to mask or metal defined. And then look at what coating buys us as we step down the sizes. Wow. If we didn't have nano coating on our stencil at a 0.69 area ratio, we would be in trouble already. And we couldn't handle the 10. 
So what I found here is on these higher area ratios, you don't see a lot of difference in actual transfer efficiency. The difference here is in the variation. And when I see that something can cut variation by more than half just by adding this film to my stencil, I have to come to the conclusion of just do it. There are so many things you can do inside a printer and with your process and your materials and your squeegee blades and your operators and your tooling support to try to cut your variation by 50%. Or you can have your stencil vendor pop a nano coating on there. To me, it's an absolute no-brainer. All right, so I'm off my soapbox about nano coating, and now I'm going to talk about a constant state of flux. Oh, this is one of my favorite slides ever. Solder paste is a mysterious material. It's thick citropic and a non-Newtonian fluid. So thick citropic means it yields when pressure is applied to it and holds a shape when pressure is not applied. That's why rolling it on a stencil shears it down and helps it flow into the apertures. And then when the shearing force is taken away, it sets back up and holds a shape. Now, the non-Newtonian part is because it does not respond linearly to shear. Every solder paste out there has a different response to speeds and pressures. That's just how non-Newtonian fluids work. But all thixotropics that share the same uh, trait that they thin down and stiffen up, just like peanut butter. In fact, for many years, I would start a class with, if you've ever made a peanut butter sandwich, you too can print solder paste because it's the same principle of thinning down when you put the knife to it and stiffening up when you take the knife away. Um, and the peanut butter sticks to the knife just like the powder paste does, sticks to the squeegee sometimes too. Now, one of the reasons I love this is because I have a solder paste tree here. Now, solder paste is expensive. Your boss is gonna tell you it doesn't just grow on trees, but for the sake of this slide, it does. And it's pretty much holding its shape in the jar as a solid as it comes down and thunks Sir Isaac Newton on the head and then spills all over the floor. Hurts like a solid, but makes a mess like a liquid, similar to your ketchup bottle. So don't try that at home. Now, some of the key terms we have to know about the mysterious metal uh, material are its viscosity, which means how easily the fluid flows under pressure, and its rheology, which is how the viscosity changes as the pressure changes. Again, because it's nonlinear, it's called non-Newtonian, and Sir Isaac's got a bump on his head. So, what actually is solder paste? You know, you open the jar and you look at it, and it's this gray, goopy, creamy stuff. Well, it's actually a suspension of tiny solder particles and a flux medium. So you have all this yellowy flux medium. It's usually yellowy because of rosin or resin. And then you have all these little particles in here. And these particles come in different sizes. Um, and they all have a little oxide shell around them. Think about M&M candies. They have that chocolatey goodness on the inside and the hard candy shell on the outside. Well, these little uh, solder powder particles have soldering goodness on the inside and a protective oxide shell on the outside that helps keep them from clumping up because we need them to flow as individuals. Now, how much is flux and how much is metal or solder particles? Well, by volume, it's about 50-50. By mass, because uh, metal is so much heavier than flux, it's about 90-10. Now, we talked about different sizes of powder particles. What we all used for like the last 30 years in SMT is type three solder powder, um, which is 25 to 45 microns in diameter, one to two mils, um, about the thickness of a human hair. What we've done recently in the last five or so years is migrate to type four, which is slightly smaller, but you see the 20 to 38 micron gives us a big overlap. So it's been really easy for us to migrate to that as an industry. Um, because they're only slightly smaller spheres, and they're about the size of volcanic ash. Now we hear a lot of talk about type five, 
which is a big jump from type three or four because it's 15 to 25 microns. And that can sometimes give us soldering issues because that oxide shell, um, there's a lot more oxide than solder in the smaller particles just because of the ratio of shell to volume. So now if we move down farther to type six, we're at the size of plant cells in the five to 15 micron range. This is getting really small. And um, where we rarely see, except for sometimes in semiconductor manufacturing, is type seven or eight. Um, and if you look at things that are type seven, it's a red blood cell. Type eight, we're down at the two micron. Um, we're talking like photosensitive cells. So the reason we like to stay with larger particles as long as we can is because they have the higher oxide to solder ratios or the higher volume to surface area ratios or also what we call specific surface. Um, so they're much easier to solder. Um, it's not uncommon when you have a type four, type five, even a type six solder to not be able to break through those oxide shells with the fluxes in the oven and get a, a defect that we refer to as graping. So that's all we need to know about solder, solder powder particles. Let's talk about flux. What the flux is in that bucket that looks like, pardon me, but earwax. Um, well, you got your solvents, you got your rosins or resins, you got your activators, you got your surfactants, you got your thixotropes, and you got the mystery stuff, the trade secrets. Now, the solvents typically maintain the ingredients and in a uniform solution. A lot of these are maybe solid at room temperature or come in powder form. It maintains them in a nice uniform solution. We typically in our solder paste have solvents with different boiling points um, to keep the paste good on the stencil and then still keep it good in the oven. Um, we also have resins or rosins. Um, what's the difference between a rosin and a resin? A rosin is the naturally occurring sap from the tree and the resin is a processed rosin or a totally synthetic uh, resin. Um, now the resins that we're using these days in lead free are a lot more robust than the rosins that we use back in tin lead. Uh, when I say robust, I mean because they're almost completely synthesized, there's much less natural variation in them. So those of us that have been printing tin lead and know how one paste batch, batch of paste can vary from another, don't have nearly as many of those reservations when we go to lead free because we know they're much more stable because the synthetically formed resins are much more stable. That said, they're also more difficult to clean, but that's a different course, not today. What these resins or rosins do is they remove the oxides, they aid in the solder joint formation, and they provide reliability on no clean fluxes by encapsulating any unspent ionic material and preventing um, any sort of electrochemical migration or dendritic growth um, out in the field. Now, the activators, they clean the passivation layer on the metals to prevent corrosion, meaning in the oven. Um, once we clean the oxide off of that lead, we're still blowing hot air at it. So we have to keep it from re-oxidizing. Um, the surfactants reduce the surface tension of the, of the solder paste or of the liquid solder to help aid in wetting and in spread. The thixotropes, well, they make the paste thick. Um, they modify the flow of the solder during pro printing. So um, you might notice some solder pastes have lower initial viscosities than others. Um, that depends on the thixotropes in them. Some pastes look really, really thick, like they're gonna be hard to shear down, but they flow great as soon as you put shear on them. Other pastes, you think they're so runny, they're not gonna hold their, their shape, but they do. This is all based on the different thixotropes that are used in the different pastes. And of course, the trade secrets are things that the world may never know. And each solder paste company has their own little book of trade secrets. So 
that's what's in the solder paste itself. Now, you've mentioned, you've heard me mention gasketing a couple times, and the worst thing you can do in printing is blow a gasket. So, on that topic, let's talk about Newton's third law. We talked about uh, Newton before with F equals ma and the solder paste tree. Um, Newton's third law says for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Correct? So I love this little comic strip um, that um, actually uh, illustrates it perfectly. Why did you hit my face with your hand? Why did you hit your hand with my face? Um, everybody sitting at home watching this, raise your hand. How many times did you pull this on your brother or sister as a kid? I know I did. I actually still do it with my dog too. Um, but now if we look down at the bottom, we see Sir Isaac Newton. He's sitting on a chair. He's pushing his weight on the chair and the chair is supporting him. It's pushing back. No matter what laws we can or cannot agree on in this country right now, Newton's third law is one we can agree on. So let's talk about how it applies to printing. The squeegee exerts a crazy amount of pressure at its point of contact. You think about how many pounds we load it with per inch, but that the contact area is so thin, it's a heavy duty PSI. So without proper board support, the pressure of the squeegee causes the stencil and the board to deflect under it. And then they snap back at different rates because the stencil spring steel, so it snaps right back. And then the board snap back slow, slower because it's um, fiberglass and copper. So it just makes a mess out of that print. This is why we say board support, board support, board support is so important. If you don't have the right board support, you're gonna have gasketing problems. You're gonna have smeared paste. You're going to have wet bridges, which is when two solder paste deposits join each other. And you're going to have deposits that are way too tall. And you're going to be failing for height errors and volume errors. So we want good board support. Here we show nice board support. We show nice gasketing. But here we don't have good gasketing. We have, as, as the, the emoji shows us, a blown gasket. What happened here was we did not get a good gasket between the aperture and the pad due to some misalignment. And now all that solder paste spilled out in here. That's gonna be a problem on the next print. The number one reason for print defects and solder defects, bad gasketing. Bad gasketing between the stencil and the PCB pad is what causes the majority of your problems. How is it we get bad gasketing? Well, again, you're used to my little um, schematic diagram here, this being the circuit board, this being a pad, and this being the stencil. We could just have poor alignment. And there's a number of reasons for that that we'll talk about. Um, we could have what we call PCB shrink. The pad is the right size. The aperture is the right size. The board is aligned with its fiducials the best it can, but the PCB is not meeting a stomach size and therefore um, it's out of position. And that gives us the, the opportunity right there for the paste pump out. Now, sometimes we have the aperture larger than the pad, not uncommon in electroform stencils or the older lamp-based lasers when the beam would go out of focus. That is, um, if the aperture is out of spec and the pad is in spec, that's a stencil problem. More often than not, your aperture is in spec and your pad is smaller than your aperture because it's really easy to over at small pads. So here you've lost the gasket on both sides. So you're gonna get pump out of paste on both sides of that. Now, once you get that pump out of paste, here we have it stuck on the bottom of the stencil. You're never going to get gasketing now because you got a layer of paste stuck on the bottom. Um, we also, if solder mask isn't aligned or registered properly and we have it encroaching on one side of the pad, not intentionally, it's not a mask defined pad, we just have bad alignment. That is going to really mess up your printing because it's going to shim up your stencil on this side and you're going to get pump out on this side. Um, also hot air solder leveling. Um, a lot of boards are still hot air leveled um, because it's inexpensive and has a good shelf life. But 
the leveling makes the dome and it's really hard to see the stencil foil on the dome. Um, so we like to stop with hot air solder leveling at 25 mil pitch and nothing smaller. A lot of people are using it on 20 mil pitch. I cringed when I saw it on a 0.4 millimeter BGA. It has no place there. There's no way you're ever gonna get a good print there. Um, so if at all possible, it's great to um, on fine pitch, avoid the hot air solder leveling if you can. Now, other common causes that um, can create poor gasking are labels. Um, quite often on my test boards, I design an area of solder mask relief to put the label in so the label doesn't stick up over the surface of the board. Um, I also hate silk screen. Hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it. Nothing can screw up a print better than silk screen because it shims the stencil up off the boards. And the spec on silk screen is anywhere from half a mil to something like two and a half. And we've all seen thick, gloppy silk screen on our boards. And of course, people like to put them like in squares right around the fine pitch stuff to make our jobs as printing engineers even harder. So um, the more we can abandon silk screen, the better. Honestly, um, when I was building cell phones at Motorola back in 99, we had gotten rid of silk screen, not for the printing problem so much as just we didn't have room for it on the boards, but man, what a difference it makes. And finally, other causes that I see a lot are um, PCB clamps. Some machines, some printers have over the top foil clamps that clamp down on each side. Um, and those will also shim your stencil up. If that's common, you can always get your stencil undercut on that side to accommodate those clamps. And uh, that will fix your gasketing issues there. So. We've talked about stencils and paste and boards and, and everything except the actual physical printing process. So now, oh, let's get rolling. All right, things are gonna get technical here. We're talking about the mechanics of the process. Now, I pulled this picture out because I snapped it at just the right exact time to show beautiful curtaining of solder paste off a squeegee blade. I think this is our first real look at a, a a photo instead of a schematic diagram. Um, so what we're looking at here, the printer, is obviously this is the big metal stencil and the gray goop is the paste. Um, right here, this is your squeegee blade and um, this is your squeegee holder. What you see on the sides here are little um, paste catchers so we don't get too much paste out on the edge of the print area. But one of the reasons this looks so beautiful to me is the way the paste is curtaining off the squeegee. When it comes off the sides and runs towards the middle and drops down and leaves a fairly smooth um, edge like that, that's, that's art. That's poetry right there. So let's talk about rolling for a minute. The squeegee motion shears and thins the paste so it can roll on the apertures, or flow into the apertures. We talked about that. What's the physics behind that? Well, um, as the paste rolls, it picks up a lot of angular momentum. And when it gets to the vertex of the stencil and the squeegee, it has to do a rapid directional change. So where does all that momentum or inertia or energy go? It results in a really high pressure area here where this stuff has to make the, um, the, the directional change. And it's that area of high pressure right there that fills the apertures. The paste does not roll and just slop itself in. Um, 20 years ago or so at Cookson, we um, rigged some side view video cameras and we could actually see how the paste, once it goes by, it starts filling from the high pressure here and kind of backfills that aperture, which is also why we sometimes see a little wedge shape. When we look at side views, that's how we know which way our squeegee was going. But basically, you got to roll it and hit that vertex to create the high pressure. Now, if you have too much paste on the stencil, you're going to generate way too much pressure and possibly blow a gasket. If you don't have enough paste on the stencil, you may not generate enough pressure and not get enough aperture fill to even touch the pad, which means you're not gonna get any paste on that board at all because you're not giving your forces of good 
any chance whatsoever to grab the paste. So this is a way cool video that I found on YouTube and asked Indium if I could um, show y'all and they said, yes, please do. So what we're gonna look for in here is paste rolling. We're gonna look for the speed rolling, not skidding or sliding, rolling. And also we want this to be sort of smooth and shiny looking. We don't wanna see any bubbles or tears as it rolls. We don't wanna see it looking dull. Um, we wanna see it dropping off that squeegee at the end of the stroke nice and gently. We don't wanna see it clinging. We don't wanna see it dripping. We wanna see a, a nice gentle dropping off. After the squeegee passes on the top of the stencil, we want to see what we call a clean sweep. And I'll point that out to you as we watch the video. Um, when you don't leave a whole lot of solder paste behind on the top of the stencil, you know you're getting very good contact between the squeegee and the stencil. You know that vertex is solid and you know you're getting good fill pressure. If you see stripes of paste or a super, well, not a really fine mist, but a heavy mist across the stencil, you're probably not filling your apertures very well. And finally, you wanna see minimal accumulation of paste outside of the print area. And you'll see when you look closely here, this also has the little keepers on the ends of the uh, squeegee to keep solder paste in the print area. So now um, let's watch the video. All right, we dispense paste on the board. Here comes the first pass. You'll notice it's back to front so we can see that rolling. And you saw maybe a few bubbles that just came out. Beautiful, beautiful. See that paste dropped right off? You can't see it very well from this direction. But right now in this video, the board is shuttling out, a new one is coming in, the alignment is happening, and in another moment, you should see, there we go. And see the clean sweep we're getting across the back. See, we have very little paste scoop falling out. And look at that solder paste coming off that squeegee. Have you ever seen anything so beautiful? So let's go back to uh, how we roll. Now, let's talk about release. We just saw the best movie I've ever seen on how to fill the apertures. Let's talk about release again and area ratio because the pace sets up in that stencil and here we have the forces of good, the adhesion of the pad and the forces of evil, the adhesion to the stencil. And again, because they're proportional, um, what we get is at smaller area ratios, we leave more paste in the stencil. Um, and when we leave it on the bottom of the stencil like that, it then interferes with the gasketing on our next print. Um, again, one last time to hammer home, the smaller the area ratio, the lower the transfer efficiency, and by the way, the higher the variation, and I'm gonna hammer it home again, nano coat your stencils. Okay, so as we're navigating printing and stencil design, we want you to round your corners. This shape here that we call a squircle is a square with rounded corners. If you don't wanna call it a squircle, you can call it a super ellipse, but I like squircle better. And um, if you notice all the icons on your telephone are squircles. So, why do we want to round off our corners? Well, because this is where paste gets stuck and dries out and makes a mess. So now I'm looking here at transfer efficiencies, uh, 10 mil apertures, area ratio 6.3, um, uncoated stencil, and circle, square, and squircle. They're all running about 100% transfer efficiency and four or 5% coefficient of variation, which is all great. And then we do a response to pause test and we wait 30 minutes and we see how these things print. And we do one where we wait and walk away for 60 minutes and see how the first print looks. And then we do one where we walk away for 90 minutes and see what the first print looks like. So after a 90 minute pause time, the squircle is still print like a champ. And the squares and the circles are getting out of control. Again, squircle's giving you half the variation of the circle or the square. 
no brainer. Round those apertures. Now, most of your stem cell vendors have software that is automatically rounding your aperture corners now, but if you're a stickler for squares, might want to reconsider and go squircles after looking at this data. Again, I actually ran this data myself so I can vouch for it. Um, so that's pretty much all we've got on how to print. Now let's talk about how to troubleshoot when things don't go quite right. So years ago, I came up with this um, sort of a five minute troubleshooting where you're gonna find your problem most of the time. So that's why we've titled this chapter, uh, Got Five Minutes? So here we go. These are 0.4 BGA test patterns. Oh, look at that beautiful print on the left. Yeah, that's a process you wish you ran. Unfortunately, what you got on the right is what you're currently running, and that's not going to cut it with your customer, is it? So what are we going to do? We're going to do this overall system check. It takes about five minutes, 10 minutes. You can incorporate it with your techs or your skilled operators, which means as an engineer, you spend less time fighting fires on the floor and more time improving your processes. And I'm sure that is music to everybody's ears. It, it sure was mine when I worked the shop floor. So again, I put this picture in because it's just a beautiful, beautiful shot of solder paste releasing nice and cleanly from that squeegee. That is something you really wanna look at. Your eye is a great troubleshooting tool um, and oftentimes. So let's say you get called out to the floor, getting bad prints. Hopefully it's because your SPI is rejecting them, not because your operator is looking at them funny. What you want to do is knead the paste, wipe the stencil, and print a board. Why am I telling you you should knead the paste? Well, because you don't know how long the long it's been down for. Your paste may um, not come back the same way um, after a 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 minute stoppage. So. You want to knead it, get it right back into its working viscosity. And then because kneading it made a mess, you're going to under wipe the underside of the stencil so that, again, you get a realistic observation of what your operators were seeing. Now you print a board. Again, I like to go back to front so I can see that paste rolling. So is the right amount of paste on the stencil? It should be about one and a half centimeters five eighths of an inch. I've heard all kinds of different things. Um, I use the rule of pinky and the rule of thumb. If you got big honking man hands, it should be about the diameter of your pinky. If you have delicate lady fingers like me, it should be about the diameter of your thumb. And we already talked about how bead size affects fill pressure. Um, it's not uncommon to see too much solder paste uh, on a stencil just because the operators don't know. That's also, by the way, a common reason for paste sticking to the squeegee is if you've got too much on there, it can kind of get hung up um, where the squeegee meets the holder. So now you have assured that you have the right amount of paste on the stencil. You're looking for it to roll. Is it rolling over the stencil and is it releasing cleanly from the blade? If it's not rolling, get it out of there. Just, just take it off. It's shot for whatever reason, worry about that later, get your production line back up and running. Um, if it's not releasing normally from the squeegee blade, if it's dripping off or if it's sticking to the blade, that's a surefire sign that there's something wrong with the paste. Um, if it's lost its sheen and it starts looking kind of gray and dry, that's another sign that there's something wrong with the paste. Um, take it offline, troubleshoot it, get new paste on there, get your production line back up and running. Um, quite often what I've seen when paste seems to get too drippy or runny is it's too hot in that printer. Some fans are burnt out or they've been unplugged because somebody on third shift didn't like the smell of the paste or a cart full of totes is parked behind the exhaust fans. So um, if you're frequently running into paste turning kind of slumpy on you, check the temperature. Um, all you have to do is stick a little fluke probe in as you're scooping it off. And finally, release from the squeegee. Um, so we want to look for the rolling. We see it spreading, but we don't want it spreading outside of that print area. If it is spreading outside that print area, 
get the end caps for your squeegees and get your operators to bring that paste back into the bead very, very frequently. Because if you let that dry out on the side of the print area for an hour and then scoop it back in the bead, you're almost assured of jamming up an aperture in your stencil. And we don't want that. So, okay, we've checked the paste. It's not the paste. Check the tooling. Now, pull the stencil out and look at it. Is there any physical damage on it? Is there any dried paste or debris in the apertures? Are the fiducials worn out or dirty? Are there any rips or tears in the mounting mesh? Has the mesh become loose over the years? Um, is it delaminating because it sat in the stencil cleaner overnight? Um, if you're nano-coated, check for cracks or chips in it. Um, if you want to check the surface energy of it, because it's uh, one that you can't actually see, get a black magic marker, a Sharpie style that you've got in your production smock, and run it over there to see if it beads up. If it beads up, you still got a lower surface energy. If it doesn't beat up and it wets out, it's time to replace the coating or the stencil. Um, look at your squeegees. Do you have damage or dings? Um, a damaged or dinged squeegee is not going to give you good fill pressure. Um, it could also damage your stencil, and this sounds crazy, but are they mounted at the right angle? Some people have different angles of attack that they use, um, and some older printers allow the operators to vary that. Um, look at your board support. Um, here I've got a picture of pin tooling. Um, is your dried paste interfering with your board seating in your tooling, or your tooling seating in your work nest? Um, can't tell you how many prints I've gone into and it's like the tooling plate, things aren't seating right because there's dried paste stuck on the tooling plate because the last person who used the tooling plate didn't clean it properly. Or let's see, they pulled the stencil before wiping the squeegees, dried paste on the tooling plate and then put it back in the cabinet that way and now the board won't seat nice on it. Um, same thing goes for paste drippage in the work nest, keeping, um, the magnetic pins from seating. Also, one time we had a staple stuck on the bottom of a pin. It took us a while to find that one. Um, so anyway, now you've checked all your tooling, your stencil, your squeegees, your board support. Now shuttle a board in and tap or press on the top of it to verify that a support. If you can get bounce out of that board, you're not going to get a good print where you're getting bounce out of it. You need pretty solid support. Now, check for moving an X and Y. If you can push it back and forth and Y, you got a problem because that uh, squeegee, when it comes down, it's going to make that board slip underneath uh, the stencil because of all the pressure it's applying to it. Um, you should not have any movement in X. You should have a board stop. But again, check, check, check because so often it's in the setup. Now, you have checked your paste, you have checked your tooling, now you're gonna check your alignment and the machine. So you're gonna reinstall your stencil and you're gonna watch the alignment process, including the vision finding the fiducials. So often you have a dirty or damaged fit on the stencil and that's what's causing the, the misalignment. Um, after you watch it, confirm it, stick your head in there. Look, make sure you can only see pads through the apertures. And while you're in there, start tapping on the stencil and check the contact between the stencil and the board. There should be no bounds whatsoever. Okay, and now go back and look at your print parameters for a minute. Are these the ones that the program's supposed to be using? Well, I hope you check that first. But do they make sense? Um, so many times it's like, well, why are you using these parameters? Well, I don't know, we always do, or uh, we use for big boards. Um, so, you know, if, if you're running something with a lot of fine pitch, it's going to be really hard to run a high speed, high squeegee speed, because you've got to let that paste um, roll in the bead and flow into the apertures and rebuild its pressure. So quite often you're going to need lower squeegee speed. So it's not a one size fits all. And um, that's, I think, what you need to look for if you've come this far down the line and you haven't found anything wrong with it. Um, you can run for internal documentation. I know like in things like auto plants that are under very strict control, um, operators are locked out of machines and can't change. Um, 
parameters, but it's still best to look at your internal documentation in case somebody did get a password. And um, tech data sheets from the suppliers aren't really the best source of information um, because they're very generic. Uh, better option if you're having issues is to call your pay supplier and talk to their tech support. So that overall system check took five, 10 minutes. It actually takes me longer to talk about it than it does to do it. <laughs> but again, it's very easy to incorporate with text or some of the more highly skilled operators. Um, four out of five times it catches a problem. It's in the setup. Now, bummer, if you've done all that and you can't find the root cause, you have to look at each defect specifically and their symptoms. So the, the title of this chapter is, um, Five minutes is up. You're still having printing issues. This is for when you've given that five minute overall check of the try and you called one of your colleagues and he or she tried it too. Then you gave it another go and you still don't know what's going wrong. So now we have to be a little bit more of an investigator and these are more of the specific defects we're gonna look at. Um, solder bridges are when the tube paste deposits connect unintentionally. This here is a pretty mild bridge. We call it like an H bridge because it's just from paste stringing on release. Um, that would probably pull back in the reflow oven as long as it had a good profile. But still, it shouldn't be on the board in the first place. So if you're seeing these wet bridges, first thing you want to look for is bad gasketing. Next thing you want to look for is your stencil cleaning parameters. You might want to wipe more frequently. Um, third thing you want to look at is your separation speed. Most pastes out there like fast separation, as fast as you can. Um, sometimes you'll find one that needs a slow separation, but there's rarely a middle ground. Um, if you're getting bridges, your squeegee pressure might be too high. Um, really, there shouldn't be a paste where you need to go over one and a quarter pounds per inch of squeegee, linear inch of squeegee and force. Um, you might have too much paste on your stencil, which is causing too much pressure and it's blowing the gasket or your paste might be getting warm. Um, check your working, working temperature and your tech data sheet because warm paste tends to slump and string and bridge like um, bubble gum on a sidewalk on a hot day when you step in it. Um, so now let's talk about peaks or dog years. Um, this is when a section of the deposit is taller than the rest. Um, the one in the middle here is beautiful. These volcanoes on the outside, this saddle, these aren't, these aren't preferable. We, we like that flat top there. So some pastes tend to print peak and dog ear more than others. It actually depends on uh, how much they sort of stick and string upon release. So if you're getting bad print definition, first thing to look at is bad gasketing. Look at your board support. The second is separation speed. Again, typically fast is best. Um, also, you might have residual paste on there from the previous print, which means you need to increase your wipe frequency. Um, you might have that because you're misaligned and you're printing part on the pad and part on the laminate next to the pad. Um, print definition on squeegee pressure, hard to say. It's either too low or too low because solder paste is non-Newtonian. You can't make a blanket statement for all of them. And again, paste might be too warm and it's getting that bubble gummy texture to it. Now let's talk about insufficiency. There's two ways to get insufficiency. One is by not putting enough paste into the aperture and one is by not getting enough paste out of the aperture. So this is for when we don't have enough paste in the aperture. It is not uncommon on big deposits like this to see it tearing out. I can tell you right now, this was the direction the squeegee ran in because when we have big, big apertures, um, the paste tends to curl around the back side of the squeegee a little bit and gets dragged out. Um, so we see that in large apertures and we also see that in areas of high density of small apertures. And I mentioned that earlier that um, sometimes 
if you have a high density area with small apertures, you have to run a slower squeegee speed to be able to get enough pressure built up to keep filling those apertures because they're draining that pressure off that bead quickly. Um, so what if we're not getting good aperture fill? Well, the first thing I would look at is, did I stop printing for a while? Did that raise the paste viscosity um, out of the working range? Usually four need strokes will get you back in. Um, anywhere between four and 10. If you've got a need board in there and you're needing four times, you might as well need five, six, or seven, or eight, you know? Um, again, for poor aperture fill, squeegee speed could be too high and it's skipping apertures or too low because it's not getting the roll going and the shear going fast enough. Um, but also have squeegee pressure too low. You're not getting enough fill. Um, you may not have enough paste on the stencil. Again, if you don't have a big enough bead, you're not gonna generate enough fill pressure. Uh, paste is cold. Paste doesn't like to move when it's too cold. Usually they bottom out somewhere in the high 60s or mid 60s where they get really stiff and they, they don't wanna move. Um, you could have paste sticking to the squeegee blade. And when that happens, um, it doesn't all fall back on the stencil. So your bead is automatically smaller and you get poor fill. And of course you get that warm or worn or damaged squeegee where it's not making good contact. You don't have a good vertex and you're not gonna get the fill. Now, the other reason for insufficiency is poor release. So let's say we fill the aperture and it's not releasing well. Uh, this one's pretty realistic. I dummied up all these pictures in a lab by pulling pins and putting print gaps and everything else. And so like this is not that realistic, but it's a great picture. This is realistically more like what we see. Um, so if we get poor release, again, it might be a pause in printing. Um, it could be residual paste building up in those apertures. So you got to check your stencil cleaning parameters, especially if you've been down for a while. Again, could be paste is too cold or your squeegee pressure is too low and it's just not thinning it down enough. Um, so again, there's always a couple different things, but this is basically the order I would investigate them in. Now, we talk a lot about poor gasketing and squeeze out. Over here, we see two prints where we had good gasketing of the stencil, the pads. Here, we did, but you see the squeeze out, it's very minor. It's very, very minor. The only issue there is it's gonna keep building up until eventually it's not minor anymore and you don't get good deposits. Um, this here, again, I did that just by um, pulling a tooling pin out from under there and allowing that board to deflect and we got one ugly, ugly print there. And I swear all I did was pull a tooling pin out from under it to make the board flex. Um, so what are the causes of board, poor gasketing? Well, we had a whole slide on them before, but look at your board support, look at your alignment. Also, you can have solder mask higher than the pads. So you need to check your mask height and compare it to the spec. Um, you can also have apertures larger than your pads, which is usually an overetched pad. Again, you could have solder leveling, but um, labels, inks, other surface features, that anything that prevents the stencil from seeding well on the PCB. So look at the proximity of features to defects. Um, a lot of times if you have over the top stencil, clamps and your or board clamps rather in your printer and you start doing defect maps you'll see they're all kind of up along the edges so again there's a lot of ways to handle poor gasketing the trick is identifying it and now poor alignment okay this is when the solder deposit isn't exactly where it's supposed to be and yeah i, I dummied these up in the lab too because i don't have access to a printer that has this bad alignment i think we moved it you know 80 microns south and east to get bad alignment. It did pretty well on that. Um, why do we get poor alignment? Are you sick of me hearing, hearing me say board support? I don't blame you, but it's so important. If you get good board support, you'll never have to worry about it. Um, 
So often you also see a printer alignment error. That's why I recommend watching the fiducial find on the screen. You may have solder paste jammed up in there. It just may be damaged, we don't know, but watch that fid find. Um, loose or torn stencil mesh will definitely make for poor alignment. Also, if you have the type of printer that has lever clamps instead of plunger clamps for the stencil, you need to make sure the stencil isn't slipping. You need to make sure those clamps are clamping tightly. Um, PCB positional error is far more common than stencil positional error. So if you're not getting alignment, look for corner to corner alignment of the apertures uh, and pads. Um, see how far off you are. Um, and I've got recommendations for whether you want to get new stencil or let surface tension do its magic. But if it's positional errors, there's nothing you can do about it except order new stencil. Um, but again, you can measure the fiducial to fiducial distance, or you can try centering it up using offsets to get um, centered up on your most critical part. And again, shrink and stretch is a problem that we all face. Um, and a lot of times just have to cut a new stencil to make up for it. So anyway, we've been through the key elements in the printing process. My main advice is maintain control of this process. It's where most of your rework comes from and it's where your money is in SMT, which is why SPI is so, so, so important. Um, when you do have problems, first do that five minute check. I'm telling you, there's an 80% chance that you're going to find the root cause of the problem right there. But if not, look through these troubleshooting guidelines and you'll see our, um, our cartoon detective has pushed through a lot of them, but he still hasn't found what he's looking for yet. He will. There's only so many things that can go wrong inside a printer. I can't believe I just said that. Anyway, that concludes um, today's presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email. It's chris at shayengineering.com. Thank you for your time.